is the director of the McPherson Eye Research Institute there, as well as the Sandra Lemke Trout Chair in Eye Research. Um, needless to say, he's very accomplished in both a clinical and surgical practice as well as his research practice, and he does really innovative work um, modeling some of the eye diseases we see in clinic, a lot of inherited retinal diseases and degenerations in uh, stem cell models, which are increasingly able to tell us more and more about these conditions that we've thus far been unable to really model effectively or understand on a molecular basis. So um, I am thrilled that he's able to talk to us today about some of his work, and um, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Gamm. Thanks, Leah. Um, so I used to come here quite a bit. For those of you who have been here for a while, um, Ray Lund used to be here, and I had a couple of grants with Ray, and so I had the pleasure of coming out to Moran on uh, a regular basis for some time before he went to Portland. So it's, uh, it's good to be back, and I, um, it was nice having dinner with Leah and Meg yesterday, too. So what I'm going to do today is kind of uh, talk about a, a couple of, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to set, the, set the tone by showing you what we've done to this point uh, to derive photoreceptor cells uh, from induced pluripotent stem cells and ES cells, but mostly IPS cells to this point. Um, and then talk to you about a couple of applications. And I know I have limited time, so I'm gonna try and uh, move along, but at the same time, if there are any questions along the way, just, just raise your hand. So it's a small enough crowd in, uh, in a room where we can be interactive on this. Okay, uh, some disclosures. Uh, I do have patents on the uh, organoid technology that that I'm going to be showing you here today um, through Wharf and the University of Wisconsin. That ultimately led to the found, founding of the company Opsis Therapeutics, uh, which is a subsidiary of Fujifilm, Cedar Dynamics International. So um, that, uh, bear that in mind. And then the, the main disclosure I want to give you is uh, who actually does the wonderful work in my lab, and that is uh, Beth Kapowski, who's a scientist, and, uh, and Joe Phillips, also a scientist in my lab. Uh, Beth does a lot of the organoid work. Uh, Joe Phillips does a lot of the uh, uh, cell, thera cell, cell therapeutic work. Um, and you'll hear their names quite a bit throughout the course of the talk. So the um, objectives of my lab, and actually of my, of my clinical practice as well, I pretty much a general pediatric ophthalmology clinical practice, but um, I do like to see patients who have genetic disorders and retinitis pigmentosa, and I marry that with the work that I do in the lab. But ultimately, um, my goal is, and I exclusively use human uh, pluripotent stem cell technology, but I want to use that technology uh, first and foremost, to investigate human retinal development. There really is no other way to study human development in a dynamic way except through pluripotent stem cell technology. You can get static images from uh, fetal tissue when it's available. You can look at primates, but even that's difficult and expensive to do. So I, I set out and doing this because I had a, a strong interest in developmental biology. Um, but then, if we're successful in being able to use developmental biology to coerce pluripotent stem cells to actually become bona fide retinal cells, then we have uh, the clay that we need to perhaps model diseases that we otherwise couldn't model from actual human patients that have clinical correlation, um, or develop cell therapeutics. And so that was what, what I hoped to be able to do, but when I started I thought, well, maybe we might be able to get these things down the path a little bit. So we use uh, induced pluripotent stem cells for the most part. Uh, we've developed over 100 different lines from different patients, and we generally use blood samples. And so patients will, uh, we have a special kit that we use, and we use T and B cells, so nucleated uh, cells from uh, blood samples. And we have a special kit that we send all over the world, um, and it's about the size of a cholesterol, what you'd submit for a cholesterol check. And then we reprogram that using a combination of Thompson and Yamanaka factors, J.B. Thompson being at the University of Wisconsin, so we're kind of partial to those factors too. But at the end of all of that, you get an induced pluripotent stem cell, which is uh, capable of producing all the different cell types in your body, at least theoretically. It also harbors the entire uh, genetic background of that particular patient, which is not a good thing if you intend to put it back into the patient eventually. You either have to correct the gene, which is a kind of, we can do that, but adds a, a very large level of complexity onto the whole process, or we can take normal donor cells that are HLA matched or um, otherwise available to be able to uh, produce the cell type necessary to target the disease. But if you're interested in studying the disease using a human system um, or developing therapeutics that are not cell-based, so say gene therapies or pharmacologic therapies, then you can commandeer the fact that there is the genetic mutation still present. And if you're able to direct them towards the cell types of interest that are affected in the disease, you can then study and help uh, test or design therapeutics. And we've done that in, uh, with a number of different diseases at this point. And this afternoon, I'll be talking specifically about best disease. 
But none of that works unless you can actually take those pluripotent stem cells, which can make heart, lung, brain, whatever, and push them towards the cell type of interest and do it in a pure fashion because you can't do stringent assays if you've got some heart muscle uh, mixed in there with a few photoreceptors. So you really have to be able to push it in an a, uh, efficient manner towards the cell types of interest, pull those out, and then be able to do that reproducibly um, and have the proper controls. Otherwise, the rest of it downstream is just going to be garbage. So it's not easy to do that. So if you start with a pluripotent stem cell, uh, you have the ability to perform all the different uh, major germ lineages. And then for retina, you had to push it towards the ectodermal lineage, and then the neuroectoderm, and then anterior neuroectoderm. You don't want to make spinal cord. And there are steps in each one of these forks in the roads. There are cues. There's mechanical cues. There's chemical cues um, that you can use to kind of push them at various levels of efficiency. But ultimately, you want the anterior neuroectoderm, which includes the eye field, which has a lot of specific transcription factors that we can use to trace this as it goes down the line. And then from the anterior neuroectoderm, you can develop forebrain or optic vesicles. Now, optic vesicles, a uh, little bit of embryology here, are uh, uh, evaginations of the anterior neural tube, uh, one on each side, that push towards the uh, surface ectoderm. This becomes the lens, the lens placode. And ultimately, this folds back in on itself and invaginates and becomes the bilayered optic cup where the proximal portion here becomes RPE and the distal portion here becomes neural retina. So even if you get to that point, you have a long way to go, because at that point it has to make a decision, well, is it going to become RPE or is it going to become neural retina? This is neural retinal progenitor cells. And we have the benefit in the, in the eye that all of the neural retinal cell types come from a common progenitor. So you start with the same cell type. So all the different major cell classes within the neural retina. And indeed, even the RPE, if you go a step before, it comes from a single progenitor. So that's nice. We don't have, to, we don't have a, a, a convening of a lot of different cell types from different cell lineages that have to come together, which would be very difficult to do in a culture. But it's not just even as simple as making a neuro progenitor cell and making all the different cell classes. They're, they're made in an overlapping fashion over a broad period of time. So this is in mouse. So this is in the order of days. But think about human, where you're talking about months and months. And you don't just get ganglion cells that are born first, and then that gets done, and then you move on to cones, and then you move on to the next one. You have these overlapping bell curves of, of cell types that are being made, such that at any point in time, you have a mixture of different cell classes at different levels of maturation. So a very complex system, as opposed to, say, RPE, which is a single cell type. And beyond that, you've got the, comple the complexity of the <coughs> tissue structure. So it's not just that you're making them, but hopefully you can make them with the proper spatial relationships to one another. And so here's just a quick diagram with all the different uh, 10 major layers. So you're looking not only at cell types, but hopefully synaptic layers. Uh, you're looking at uh, inner and outer limiting membrane formed by the, by the Mueller glia. And here's histology kind of showing what this looks like in a, in a human retina. Okay, so to skip over about eight years worth of work, that's what we sought out to do in a very systematic, kind of stepwise fashion to be able to take it from one step to the other. So first, can we make anterior neurectoderm? These are PAC6 positive cells. There's this whole set of, of uh, transcription factors that we needed to push it to. For that, we had a lot of uh, help uh, from the neural stem cell biologists at the University of Wisconsin who were already moving this technology towards forebrain, spinal cord. So we had a lot of knowledge. We were able to stand on the shoulders of giants to get it to the point where we were at the threshold of the eye field or the optic vessel. <coughs> and this required a, actually surprisingly little chemical manipulation. So we didn't have to do an awful lot to, to get it to go in the right direction, but it required a lot of mechanical manipulation. So the key was to be able to pull these things up into a 3D aggregate. And so we did that very in the, in the very beginning when most folks were doing 2D cultures because we already knew that it was very successful in developing forebrain organoids. And as I showed you earlier, the neural retina is just an outpouching of the forebrain. So if it works for forebrain, I figure, well, it should work for optic vesicle too. And if I can get those optic vesicles, then I've purified that step, and then everything beyond that will be retina. So a couple of different steps. Ultimately, we, we raise them up into three, we plate them back down, and neural structures don't like to, don't like to stick <coughs> the substrates on a plate. Uh, so the, uh, let's go here. So these little areas, they, they make almost like little neural tubes with a little lumen in the middle, and then this area here is only lightly adherent to the underlying laminin or other substrate that we use, we use multiple. And so they easily pop off, either mechanically or we can use it with some trituration. And then, lo and behold, we get these two sets of, of structures that are floating in 3D. We have these kind of more homogeneous ones that are actually forebrain. I'm not going to show you that. Um, but the forebrain and the neural retina do grow together. And then we have these golden cheerios, these vesicular neuroepithelial phase bright structures that are initially about the size of a head of a pen. 
Uh, and those can, because they look so distinct, we can, we can separate those out. We can now do that robotically um, and get large populations of these structures. So what are these structures then? And then we can take them for upwards of even 400 days and allow them to mature uh, like they would in utero. So this is an example of a, of a bunch of these. We can get thousands of these from a single culture. And if we do a cross-section and we look to see what is it composed of, because as I said before, there's a common retinal progenitor cell. So if this is truly an optic vesicle that can give rise to the neural retina, then initially it should be composed of a neural retinal progenitor cell. And we're very fortunate in the eye to have a whole number of, of markers that specifically identify cell types, which other tissues do, do not have. Uh, so for in this case, visual systems homeobox 2 and Chi-67 is a proliferative marker, basically show us that we have the vast majority of the cells are starting out as a neuroretinal progenitor cell. And if we let it go, in this case, this is over 160 days, they, they change. We had a recent development paper that, that characterized the different stages that these went through. But ultimately, they get to a stage where they're quite large, up to three millimeters. I mean, they don't get like an eyeball, but they get pretty big. Uh, sometimes they'll have little bits of RPE on them, but they never fold back into an optic vesicle. I could talk about that more later, but they're actually flipped in terms of their uh, orientation. Um, and at stage 160 or beyond, we call it stage three, the folks in the front can see this, but it has this very interesting, and this is all of them from, a, from one culture. So you can see they have different sizes. Some of them are circular, some of them are more oblong, some of them have lobular aspects to them. Um, and here's one that looks like a gingerbread man, so I always show this one. Um, but if you look at the front, you'll see these little hair-like structures that surround the entire, the, the entire thing. And I'm going to talk more about that later, but I'll tell you that those are outer segments. So they form, uh, they form an, uh, uh, a uh, interphotoreceptor matrix, and they will extend very long outer segments that are light responsive, and I'll show you that as well. And so we've gotten very good at this to the point where all, all of our lines, we can push a good majority of those uh, organoids towards this late stage of development. So to get you from where I showed you before, here's that progen that starting with that early uh, organoid, if you take a cross section, here are those progenitor cells. But the first cells that are born are retinal ganglion cells shown in purple. Then if you go a few more, uh, a couple more weeks, then you start seeing the birth of early uh, photoreceptor precursors as shown by uh, Conrad Homeobox gene here in Recoverin. And they undergo a interkinetic movement. So they're going back and forth from the apical to basal side of this neuroepithelial structure, dividing and, then, and sending off um, daughter cells, just like you would see in a normal retina or in the development of the cortex. A little bit later on, at day 146, you start to see this lamination, where you start to see different cell types coming, um, you know, finding their way within the structure. You do lose interretinal structure. So the ganglion cells that were born early, they've got nothing to project to, and they're also limited by diffusion from the uh, media outside of it. So they, they tend to die off a little bit, and we're working on ways in which to maintain that. We think we've got something, but uh, my interest is almost entirely in the outer retina, so this is a nice thing for me because it, it um, uh, uh, pushes everything towards the cell types that I'm more interested in. But you can see out here, this is uh, ML opsin, red and green opsin, so you start to see the nubbins of outer segments. And then here's the uh, outer nuclear layer where the photoreceptors are. And there are some misplaced photoreceptors, too, some, some photoreceptors that lost their way. And then ultimately, at day 200, you can see not only do we see this photoreceptor layer, but the cones, which is, should be a single layer on the outermost portion of the outer nuclear layer, indeed find their way on the outer portion. Here's some, some outer segments that are sticking out here. But the, in red are all the uh, uh, red-green cones. And then the rods form a four to five cell layer thick um, uh, nuclear layer beneath that, just like they would. And essentially, this is very similar to periphobia. So not phobia, because that would be all ML cones, but not periphery, where we would see a much higher ratio of rods to cones. So if we blow this up a little bit and compare this to a similarly staged third trimester uh, primate retina, it's pretty close. You know, it's not, no cigar, but, um, but, it's, but it's pretty close when you look at the cones and where they're arranged, and then the nuclei of the rods beneath that. And again, here are some misplaced uh, photoreceptors uh, as well. Interspersed in all this would also be uh, bipolar cells. I'll show those later. And there will be some ganglion cells too, but we do get some cell loss over there. Okay, so just to show you how these things look in 3D, because it's easy to show you just little, little bits of, let's see here. Oh, where are we? There we go. Little bits of things, little rainbows, and say, oh, that's what it all looks like. There's variation around these organoids. So depending on what side of the moon you look at, you can see differences. So here in green are, are uh, rods. 
and red are cones. And you can see there are areas where there are more cones and, and areas where there are more rods because there are waves of differentiation. But you can imagine how if you're doing an assay and you're taking sections and you're saying, my readout is how many rods that I see, that depending upon where you make a section here, you could be led astray. Right? That's why you, know, you have to know the technology because you can get fooled by a simple little part of a rainbow in one section out of 200 different sections. And then here's, I said before, uh, here's a marker, uh, Physics 2, which is an early marker of progenitor cells, but in later uh, retina, it becomes a marker of bipolar cells. So here's where you can see the bipolar cells. You can start to see an outer plexiform layer, a synaptic layer forming here. I'll get back to that. And again, rods, cones. Here's the ratio of, of S cones to LM cones. So that's, you should have way more LM cones than you have S cones, and that's true. So here's one L L S cone here, one blue cone. The rest of these here lined up in the outer portion in orange are all red-green cones. And then if we blow the whole thing up so that I can show you some more structure, once again, what I'm showing you here is an area where it has mostly uh, cones in red, uh, and their outer segments are here, right up here. Their uh, cell bodies are here, and then they have these long axons, and they end in a very specific cone-like synapse uh, called a pedicle, which are very broad-based. Now there's one, one rod in here, I'm going to show you in a second, it's going to be yellow. And you're going to see this <coughs> tiny little outer segment, and then you have to follow it all the way down here to its cell body. And then it ends in a much smaller, uh, more uh, 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 punctate sort of synapse called a spherule. And it'll, the red will go away here in a second, you'll be able to see that one right there. So in here are your displaced ones. And interestingly, they express all the right markers in the right order, but they just don't look as pretty. So I've been telling you these are outer segments. Do we know they're outer segments? Yes, our lab and other groups have, have shown that. So if you, what, in an ideal world, what we'd see are these nice stacked disks, but that's really in a mature photoreceptor. And remember that we're, we're taking things really in the stages uh, embryologically. So we've got kind of a, a mid to late third trimester um, outer segment. And so in that case, what we expect to see is something a little more disorganized. So we see the disks, they're not stacked, they're a little haphazard, they're starting to get there, and they're not really pretty. You see this uh, uh, connecting cilium here. Um, so it has all the different elements, especially at the base of the, of the connecting cilium, but it really is kind of a late fetal stage. Here's a close-up uh, of what those disks look like. And on the other end, the other business end of a photoreceptor is the synapse. I alluded to that a little bit earlier. Um, and that, here's that synaptic layer, and ribeye is a synapse marker. Um, and the photoreceptors and bipolar cells make a very um, uh, specialized synapse called a ribbon synapse. It's found there in cochlear hair cells and bipolar cells and photoreceptors. <coughs> so it really is specific uh, in the retina for a photoreceptor um, synapse. And so if we look, what we're looking for are these kind of these ribbons with vesicles around them filled with glutamate that are going to uh, go into this cleft that surrounds either uh, a triad synapse, so it'll be horizontal and bipolar cells. And sure enough, on EM, that's what we see. We see these uh, electron microscopic dense structures, these ribbons, and people up front can see all the vesicles that are surrounding it. And they're surrounding uh, the dendrites of uh, either a bipolar cell or a, or a horizontal cell. There's actually another one down here. And they respond to light. And this is work that we're doing with uh, Raunik Sinha. And not only do they respond to light, but they respond in a wavelength-directed manner. So we can uh, patch clamp onto cones and determine whether it's a green cone or a red cone based upon its, spectr its spectrum of uh, response. It's graded and repetitive, so we can go back and increase the intensity of the light and see greater and greater responses. Um, so that's really exciting to us so that we can uh, start to look at different uh, model systems and, and look at the function of the organoids and not just the histology and ICC. Okay, so that's a lot of background, but I thought I'd do that prior to um, talking to you about a couple of applications of the technology so that at least I could try to uh, convince you of, of what it, the system can do, but also what it can't do. So it's not perfect, as I've shown you today. So you have to right-size the questions that you're going to ask to the system that you're using always, whether it's an animal model or, in this case, a culture-based model. Um, now, in the afternoon, I'm going to talk about modeling and drug and gene therapy testing uh, with our best disease work. Uh, but today what I want to uh, touch on are uh, some cell-based therapeutic work that we're doing as well as uh, using this technology to uh, come up with new genetic diagnoses. So we can convert all of the, the entire protocol to GMP, which means that we can do it in a, in a manner in which we can uh, use it for patients. We can pull out those photoreceptors so we can get a, essentially a purified uh, population of photoreceptor precursors. 
Um, and this is just an example here. We have, we're lucky to have a GMP facility two floors down from my lab at the Weissman Center of Wisconsin. And so we did the early work there. We subsequently converted it over to um, Opsis Therapeutics. Now, the simplest thing to do would be to be able to take the cells and place them in the subretinal space without much fanfare. But as I've shown you, these are very specialized cells and they have an orientation. They know what's up, they know what's down. And while if you just put them into the subretinal space, they may be able to figure things out or it may just be probability and, and some of them will and some of them won't. And so that's gonna limit your, your response, that and, and about a thousand other things. Uh, but if we're able to uh, seed them perhaps into a scaffold, then we might be able to you know, hedge the bets in, in the favor of having them have the correct orientation. And so we uh, published uh, last year in Advanced Materials the work that we did with a couple of fantastic uh, engineers. One's a biomaterials engineer, that's uh, Sarah Gong, and Jack Ma is a uh, microfabricator, and he works mostly on microchips for computers, and he's world famous for that. And I said, well, can you do the same sort of my, you know, minute manipulation for a biologic, like a photoreceptor, that you can for uh, a computer chip? And he loved that idea. Uh, so sometimes you dangle a new carrot in front of somebody and get them really excited. Uh, so the initial design, uh, this is kind of what it looks like here. There's a degradable and a non-biodegradable form. Uh, we use always the biodegradable. Um, it can be made for pennies on the dollar. The initial mold takes quite a bit, of, is, is expensive. But once you make the mold, you can make uh, over and over again these sheets uh, for pennies. And if you look up close, they have what we call a wine glass design. So the idea was to capture an individual or maybe two photoreceptors and then have a, a, a through channel that would hopefully um, mechanically get them to send their axons down that so it would be oriented. And we checked modulus to make sure it had the right uh, stiffness so that it wouldn't be too stiff for the retina or too soft to manipulate in the subretinal space. And then we use, we actually, this is actually the reason why they're red is, is we um, engineered one of our lines to express TD tomato in all the photoreceptors. And so that allowed us to, without staining them, be able to do live imaging. <coughs> And this is uh, one of these scaffolds, a portion of one of these scaffolds, seeded with, uh, with uh, photoreceptor cells. And you can see that they have, at least they're sending something down those through channels. And this is it poking out the other end. And this turns out to be the end of an axon. And so if you do staining, you see that uh, synaptophysin, which is a photoreceptor, a presynaptic uh, photoreceptor uh, uh, marker, they're clustered here at the very bottom. Here's another example of that. So being able to orient them in these structures is, is important. The problem with this was that the payload was so small. So uh, we were able to get most of these, these wine glass wells filled with photoreceptor cells, but it, it took a lot of cells to do it, and then ultimately you had your ratio of biomaterial to biologic was very high. And so we wanted to, to limit that. So we switched to this new second generation design, which is more of an ice cube tray design. So each one of these then has, th about, has nine through holes within it. And with that, we can have a much larger payload. We essentially quadruple the number of cells we can deliver and reduce the, number of, the amount of biomaterial inversely, so one quarter of the amount of biomaterial. So the amount that has to biodegrade in the subretinal space is much, much less. And so when we do this in a rat, this is, this is a, a S334 uh, Tur uh, rhodopsin degenerate, degenerative uh, rat model, um, one of Matt Lavelle's uh, models. Um, and we use this because it's severe degeneration. So by the time we even look at these animals, they have a couple of cones, but essentially their outer nuclear layer and photoreceptors are entirely gone. So we don't have to worry about biomaterial. We're also doing a xenograph with human into rat, so we can use human-specific markers. So the idea of are we seeing the donor cell or are we seeing something transferred to a host cell is obviated. Um, so here's where we see uh, the, the, the human nuclear marker here. And we're, we've recapitulated or reformed an outer nuclear layer. Um, in the control animal, there's nothing here. This is just, this is inner nuclear layer and bipolar cells, and then all the photoreceptors are gone. If we use a photoreceptor marker. They're not perfectly oriented by any means. Um, and I don't show you the control where we just do uh, dis dissociated cells. But A, we get much, much better survival. We're able to control the thickness of the outer nuclear layer and the region in which we, we uh, um, uh, place it. So there's no gravity forces where it's kind of, there's more in one area of the bleb than, than in the other. Um, and there is an orientation that's much better than if you just do a dissociation. And there's an interaction. This is, this is a little bit of just abstract art, I think, for a lot of folks. But um, here's the cells, uh, the, the human nuclei here. It's kind of a blow up here. And then we're looking at a marker for the host bipolar cell processes. So in, the, in a situation where you've got a totally degenerate outer nuclear layer, so there's nothing to, for the cells to integrate into because there's no outer nuclear layer there to begin with. So you're trying to recapitulate that layer 
not have the cells migrate up into the bipolar cell layer or further. So in that case, the idea or the concept of integration really is process integration. Are the axons of the photoreceptors and the dendrites of the bipolar cells and the horizontal cells intermingling to lock those two into place? And are the synapses being um, uh, co-expressed? And the answer to that is yes, and we're now doing rabies virus tracing to be able to show that these uh, hopefully are uh, functional synapses. And we started to do this in large animals now. And this is with Juan Amaral uh, at NEI and Kapil Bardi's group. There we go. This is in pig. And so this is, uh, I'll kind of walk it through here. Here's him making the subretinal bleb uh, in, one of, in, a, in a wild type pig. This is really just kind of uh, handling it um, and not um, you know, really looking at function because these are, these are normal pigs. But we wanted to be able to see, can we get these into the proper space? And we're using a lot of the same techniques that Kapil is using for his scaffolded RPE studies. There's a lot of kind of stuff up front, but It'll get more interesting here in a second. So here's the injector, and you can't see because it it's transparent, but here's the biodegradable <laughs> scaffold, and that's filled with photoreceptors. So it's a photoreceptor patch. And then here's him placing it into the subretinal space. And this is the first pig. And it, he was the first to tell me that these are kind of sticky um, and not super easy to move around. And so we're you know, taking that feedback. Uh, I'm not a retina surgeon, I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist, so we're taking, here's an uh, intraoperative OCT showing he gets it into the right space, but with more manipulation than we would like. Granted, these would be totally blind individuals, but we'd like it to be a little more gentle than that. But that was a first pass, and so we're doing a lot of these in pig and now canines at UPenn. Okay, so that was uh, talking a little bit about cell-based therapeutics and how am I doing on time? Okay, all right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is how we can use that same technology to help um, with folks who have retinitis pigmentosa but don't know their gene defect. And so um, these days with advancement in genetic testing, if somebody de novo walks into my clinic, about two thirds of the time, if we just send them to uh, various uh, um, testing centers, we can get a, a, um, a diagnosis. We'll understand, we'll be able to tell the parents what the gene defect is. And that's more and more important as uh, not only just the RP65 and Spark Therapeutics product, Luxturna is now FDA approved, but there are so many other um, gene therapy and other um, uh, clinical trials that are coming online. And so you wanna know if your kid or yourself are eligible for these. And you also, it's peace of mind to know that people, you know, who, it, who in the world is working on this, my particular disease? So this is a very distressing part of the pie to be part of. Um, now, interestingly, our organoids uh, make, and some of these are RPE based, but our organoids make all of these um, genes. So essentially they uh, express all the genes that are known to cause RP, uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa or inherited uh, outer retinal degenerative disease. Um, and so our thought was that, okay, so if, if with whole exome sequencing and even whole, whole genome sequencing, and the latter being just a whole gamish of, of various SNPs, we can't find it it's very likely that what we're missing are mutations in these known genes, but in areas in introns that are causing cryptic splice sites or other problems in the expression of the gene, so on, in the transcriptome. But you can't biopsy the retina, but we can make an unlimited supply of anybody's retina. So essentially, we can offer the geneticist a biopsy of that patient's uh, retina. And then you can combine the genome sequencing or the exome sequencing, or genome sequencing, with uh, the transcriptome sequencing from the organoids, and then try to find these uh, cryptic splice sites or otherwise <coughs> hidden mutations. And so we did this with, um, and, and Mike Farkas is actually working with, with Meg here, and so we had dinner with him yesterday, which was very nice, uh, but also Eric Pearson and, and, and Revital in his laboratory. Uh, we've looked at a number of different families, um, and here's one uh, in the Boston area where they had no, no diagnosis, but two affected daughters and one unaffected son. Um, and I won't go over the clinical um, uh, features of this patient, uh, but they were known to Eric, but I was blinded to that. Um, and so he had done whole genome sequencing on the blood of all three of these individuals and had come up with an idea, but it didn't explain the disease. And so uh, we had a, a grant together, and so what, what we did is made um, iPS cells from each one of these individuals, uh, created organoids, Now they look a little different, and that's because I purposefully made them so that they had a good amount of RPE in them. So we didn't know whether it was an RPE-based defect or a, neuro, or a photoreceptor-based defect. So we wanted to hedge our bets and submit samples from all of those. 
Uh, and so we purposely picked those that had more of these tufts of RPE on them uh, than other ones that might, we might want to be more pure neural retina. We then um, made sure that they were equivalent to one another in terms of the amount of cones versus rods versus and S cones versus LM cones because we didn't want to introduce art artifact. And if we're going to be looking at genes expressed in and, and perhaps levels of, of genes expressed in cones or rods or RPE, we wanted to make sure we had roughly the same levels or very closely the same levels of those cell types in each one of the control and proband and affected sibling samples. So we did that just to make sure we were all on level playing ground. Again, keep bearing in mind the limitations of the system. And then when we did that, uh, and we kind of uh, unblinded the whole thing, uh, there were a number of SNPs that uh, segregated with the two affected and not the unaffected individual. And then there were a number of splice variants that also um, uh, segregated with the affected versus the unaffected. But of those, only 12 overlapped and only one had a causative mutation that introduced a cryptic splice site. And that was in the gene CNGB3. So this is causes achromatopsia. And turns out this, that that was the picture that this child had. The child had a picture of achromatopsia. Um, and so what we found was that there was a, a single base pair mutation in an intron that introduced a cryptic splice site, such that um, what we saw was this introduction of this vestigial exon, which caused a premature ter termination and non-functional protein. That's important because CNGB3 is moving towards clinical trial. So we, in this case, we took a family in Boston who did not know why their two daughters were, were blind uh, or uh, had severe low vision. And all of a sudden, we're able to say, not only do we know what it is, but there's a clinical trial coming down the pike that they may be able to benefit from. And so that's, I think, a really important way in which we can use the technology to affect patients without having to put it back into that patient. Now, we also have the benefit of having those organoids to use as a testing system thereafter. So we can test gene therapies. We can test things in the organoids that we made to do the transcriptome analysis. And so in this case, what we did is we got, uh, since I hadn't worked with CNGB3 before, we got an antibody. We validated it in postmortem human tissue and made sure that the CNGB3 localized just to cone outer segments, which it did. So we knew we had a good, a good tool. Again, validating your tools is key both the system, the culture system, as well as your antibodies and everything else. And then when we looked at the unaffected sibling, that brother, we also saw, again, not nearly as pretty as a real human uh, uh, retina, but we have our louder segments here. Um, and if we look at expression of CNGB3, we see that, again, they're co-localized in these outer segment regions. But in the proband, as well as the affected uh, sibling, we see that not only is it not present, in the outer segment, but it's mislocalized. And we see mislocalized protein throughout the cytoplasm and in the inner segments. And so this gives us a phenotype to look at if we want to test for base editing, gene editing, uh, gene augmentation type therapies, which we're doing. Um, and we can test you know, promoter strength, promoter specificity, uh, uh, duration of promoter expression, things like that um, using these systems, uh, which otherwise would have to be, doing or, uh, be done in a, in a rodent model. Um, and in particular with gene editing, because your gRNAs that, that, are, that you have to fashion have to be specific to that, that um, uh, region of, of the exon that you're trying to cut, that can't be done in any other system except a human system and actually that patient's depending upon what their uh, genetic variations are. So uh, to finish up then, um, the that that system has a remarkable capacity to recapitulate, especially the outer uh, portion of the human retina but it really reaches a late third trimester stage. So we're not seeing stack disks. We've yet to be able to get this to get together with RPE. Mm -hmm. um, so these, those are, there's definite limitations to the system. Um, but as we learn more about that, we'll be able to apply them with more confidence. But for right now, it's important to right size the questions that we ask so that we can get real, good, real answers out of them and not just a bunch of artifact and, and, and start chasing our tail. So uh, with that, I want to thank the laboratory here. Uh, some of these folks have moved on to other jobs in industry and, and academia, um, and the collaborators that were mentioned throughout the talk and the support that we have specifically for this project. Um, and then, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions, or I will cede the floor. Thank you for a great talk. Good to uh, see you. Nice to see you, <laughs> too. Um, so uh, did you have to, like, uh, troubleshoot how, uh, how quickly the biodegradable 
you know, is there a certain time? Yeah, we had no clue. <laughs> you know, we had, yeah, so it's PGS, which has been used throughout the body, and even in the eye, too. Um, you know, the first thing that we did was took um, uh, white rabbits and just put it in the, in, the, in the vitreous. And so we took the most inflammatory thing we possibly could. We, were, we had the benefit of working with Tom Holman uh, out of industry. And so he said, well, don't even go forward unless you see that it's not going to kick up a, uh, a ton of inflammation. So we did that, and it was inert, which was great. Um, and then we could see it degrade in the vitreous. And it was pretty slow in the vitreous, which is fine. We don't want to dump a whole bunch of biomaterial in the subretinal space all at once. But it was months and months. It was a little bit, I mean, what do we want? We don't even know what we want. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. like, okay, I don't want it to be three days, because that's an awful lot to have to absorb, especially with the first generation. Mm -hmm. I also don't want it to be two years, you know? So, I don't know, I just, month, you know? Yeah. And, and so you can tune that with these. But the, the give and take is the, um, the modulus and the handleability. Right? So if you make it too soft and too quick, then it sticks to things and the surgeon who wants to kind of push it a little bit further underneath, um, it grabs the retina above it. And, and so these are all things that Sarah Gong, who's a biomaterial person, can say, oh yeah, well, we can layer it with this or layer it. But of course she doesn't know the retina. So the thing she wants to layer it with, you know, blows things up. And so, you know, so it, it's, it's this really interesting and very fun uh, back and forth. The arduous part about it is the testing, because you can do all these things, but until you get it, first we did it in rats, which is fine, but that's an entirely different, you know, we're going transclerally with that, we're shoving it in there. Um, so when you move to an large animals, which you don't want to do, because it's expensive, with something that you don't know, you're, you don't hope to be very close with, um, but until we did the large animals, we're like, ah, we, there, were, there were issues that we didn't know about until we went in, in, that, in that range. But we're, we're close, I think we're, we're happy with that. Um, it's not going to be a first wave um, because it's a, a high level of complexity to both manufacture it. We can sterilize them just fine, um, but it will take longer for that to get, if it ever does, it would take longer for that to get to patients. Um, but I like the, the fact that we can control it, um, but you're also introducing a lot of variables that may not be good. So the more we can make it biologic and less synthetic, the better off I think we'll be. Well, thank you very much.